Welcome to Corner of the Galaxy, the show that talks 100% L.A. Galaxy soccer. We're glad you could join us. Now it's time to sit back and relax as your hosts navigate through the twisting, turning, but never boring world of the five-time MLS Cup champion, L.A. Galaxy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Kessman, coming to you on a Thursday, May 27th, the L.A. Galaxy getting ready to take on the San Jose Earthquakes coming up this Saturday. That's where a lot of the focus of this show will be, but there's a lot of Galaxy news to get through as well, and we're going to have a special guest joining us in less than 15 minutes. So we have a lot of stuff to get to, uh, certainly some injury updates. We had a media call today. We're going to get you uh, through all the Galaxy news that you need to have today so that way you're ready for the game on Saturday, and this is the last limited attendance game as well. June 19th, everything kicks off. So a lot of stuff to get to, a lot of stuff to talk about to help me do all that. He's back. We're glad to have him. It's Eric, the Portuguese Hammer Vieira. Eric, how's it going, buddy? It's going very well. Excited to be back right before our, our own little COG international break that we're taking here. So glad to be here before before we depart for Switzerland. Yeah, yeah. I was. Gonna, are we going? We should be going. That's a good idea. That's, I think we should. I, I think we should. Yeah, I thought I thought we were gassing up the jet and, oh. and simulating all the way over to. I, how sad! I couldn't name a city in Switzerland. The, what, what's? It's it's like a it's a it's a country that's the size of some large cities. So I understand. I mean, it's all the same as far as but I'm going to say. Yeah, they're they're I'm playing. Google it. They're playing in a city. I know that. I know I couldn't pronounce it because I looked at it before and I was like, I don't think I'm just going to say they're playing in Switzerland. Let's just let's just call it that. Good, so good call. Yeah, I know. We're really good. Um, by the way, uh, I, I should tell everybody as long as Zurich. everything. Zurich. Zurich. Good job. Zurich, Switzerland. Good, good job. I'm glad you figured it out. Um, I, I should tell everybody our, our special guest is Dennis DeClosa, GM, general manager of the LA Galaxy, um, should be coming into the show about 8.15 or so, uh, right around that that uh, that breaking point. So as long as everything goes well, he will be joining us. And if not, then he won't be joining us. But I at least have suckered you into listening for the first you know 15 minutes or so of the show. <laughs> so I feel fine with it. I, I don't have any problems Perfect. with that. Are, are you good with that? Again, morals out the window. You know, I've been watching a little bit of The Circle on Netflix, so it's okay to a little deception if that if that helps out. Go it, for it. It's they're little white lies. That's what it is. Yeah. It's it's a, a, some little white lies. So we're gonna go. Let's get started with some some fun stuff because I know we're gonna quickly translate into some of the heavier stuff. And so, um, you know, before we before we get Dennis on, let's get to through some of those things. Uh, I told you many times that the uh, the MLS sends out these little like previews of the weekend, right, Eric? And they're like, here's what's happening this weekend, but they always have like stats at the top. And and whenever the stats come out, they usually involve LA Galaxy players. Even if they're not talking about LA Galaxy players, there's LA Galaxy players in there. And so, um, you know, one of the things they're looking at is uh, Lucas Zellerion, uh from Columbus scored two set piece goals or two free kick goals, I should say, yeah. um, in their last game. Uh, and now that puts him on three for the year. And you you should say, wow, that's a lot of goals in a short amount of time to be set for to be scored from a set piece um, or from a free kick. I have to be specific from a free kick. Um, <laughs> and it, it would be I don't know, maybe some people found this interesting, but I found it interesting. Uh, there's two ways that we can sort of talk about this for a second. Um, we can talk about Sebastian Giovinco, who played for Greg Vanny and who is the leader in free kick goals um, in a single season. He had six in 2017 and he also holds the second place one. He had five in 2015 so he had uh he had some very good seasons um in both of those years uh that get i mean if you look at that if you look just in one season he gave his team six goals from yeah. set from a free kick that's a huge number whenever you're trying to you know score goals and win games right yeah absolutely and especially when you you look at 
you know, wind fouls happen and distance away from the box, uh, you know, penalty kicks, that's a different thing we just saw with Manchester United and Villarreal. Um, you know, that's a little bit easier of a conversion if you know what you're doing. But outside of the box with a free kick, the, the degree of difficulty, because you have, you're able to set up a wall, you're able to, you know, set up some things and the goalkeeper gets a little more lead time to react. So it really is a lot more difficult of a task. Most obvious thing ever, of course, saying that the further away you get. Um, but yeah, six goals and then followed up, you know, by five, the fact that he holds the top two, I think is super impressive for Giovinco. And then uh, that 2012 Be- Beckham season, that that makes sense to me. We know Beckham, that's that's his trademark. That's what he's known for, bending it like Beckham. It's not it's not a slogan, not not a slogan for a reason. So, uh, you know, of course, he's going to be on that list. But four seem, seems low when you think about, you know, the free kicks and that, that being his calling card. The fact that he's not at the top of the list is a little disappointing. But at the same time, what, when you saw what Giovinco did, it makes sense why he's at the top of the list, too. Yeah, they also went into uh, some of the game-winning free kick goals, which I thought was interesting. Um, one of the ones was uh, Didier Drogba. And if everybody remembers, he had yeah. a free kick goal <laughs> against the LA Galaxy in like the 94th minute, I think. Um, was that up in Montreal? I think it was I, in Montreal, wasn't it? Or was I it down here? So. I, I remember it was It was definitely Brian Rowe, right? I, I, and, you know, I know he retired this week. So. I was going to say that. You know, happy that's retirement, a, Brian Rowe. Let's, yeah, let's l- dig up that dirt this week. Yeah, let's talk about something you definitely didn't want to remember uh, at all. But congratulations to Brian Rowe. Um, such a, uh, you know, having having worked around him for, for you know, a couple of years and got to see him on a regular basis. Um, such a nice guy. Uh, you know, I I don't know if people if this puts it in perspective for people, but maybe whenever you watch people's careers, sometimes you can actually think, you can actually see how how fine the line is between massive success and longevity in a career. Mm-hmm. And you know, a, a guy who played professional soccer, who was a starter for many teams, um, and you know, is is going to sort of go out with I, I don't want to say a whimper, but you know, qu- rather quietly. That, I mean, most that's how most people retire rather yeah. quietly, you know, off th- in the distance. I think, and I think that's <laughs> happy retirement, Brian Rowe. Remember that time you bungled one in front of Didier Drogba and also you're, you know, you're kind of being forced out of the league because there are no other suitors, you know? So that's, it's, it's unfortunate, but you're absolutely right. It, very few people get the, the David Beckham send off the Landon Donovan send off, you know, the, the charity match where you do that, that's where you get, you know, these players who have, you know, 15 year careers and they're legends. That's, that's very rare. You know, most right. of the time it's a player who, you know, puts in nine, 10 years and then, you know, you think they're unable to get that next contract and then that's how they go. But uh, when you think about it, you know, we're, we're soccer fans here. We love the game. We love the sport. And to be able to say you played professionally for nine years, that's a win. That's a success. I'll take and, that. And regardless of what happens, you can't take away those nine years and you, you'll you always have that uh, in your pocket and, and to, to share at dinner parties or whatever comes next for Brian. So, you know, shout out to him because that's something a very, very small percentage of people on this earth can say they played professional sports and he's he gets to say he's one of them so credit to him uh, for being able to live the dream yeah it certainly is an us eric that's for sure he has yeah, nine he sure. has nine more years of professional soccer than i have nobody ever paid <laughs> i i paid to play every single time uh i was playing soccer nobody ever paid me to play soccer so um no it's it, it's sort of fun to to think about that the other fun thing that i want to get to um before we we try to bring on uh dennis closely here is the i i can't believe we're doing this like there's a part of me that doesn't want to do this at all because i have been so staunchly against these and I have a reason for it, so I, I will explain my reason. But MLS put out their MVP power rankings. So this is the most valuable player power rankings. And thank God they didn't rank everybody, you know, in that list. Yeah. They did a top five. So <laughs> I, I, can de- say, I can deal with the top five. Yeah, a 200 player list probably would not have been fun to read through. Um, but but you're right. The, the previous power rankings... They did it again this week, and we vowed last week that we were never going to speak of it again. So I'm glad that we're we're shifting to the MVP power rankings. Obviously, we have a vested interest interest on who's at the top of that list, and so that's why we'll talk about it. But I know you're going to go a little bit more in depth on why the maybe the MVP power rankings have a little bit of a spin to it than the other power rankings. Yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, we should we should point out. I mean, obviously, Chicharito is in that discussion, and uh, you know, before we go too far and even tell you, guess what? Chicharito is number one on the on the power rankings list right now. Um, in my mind, he's overranked a little bit. He's probably the second. I would actually probably put Rui Diaz above him right now, just the way that Seattle is playing. And by the way, Seattle has two players on this list. So 
Um, you know, there's a reason that they're the number one team in the league right now, and that yeah. seems that seems pretty clear. Um, but just based on you know how Seattle's playing and how much they're able to incorporate Rui Diaz into their attack and 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 sort of be that centerpiece, um, I would put him as the number one. So you know, I don't even really agree with these, but I would I would put Chicharito number two. I, I have no problems with that. So we're really arguing you know little tiny things. But well, my my big deal here is that they actually gave reasons. Eric, they talked well, about the go. players. How about you, that? I mean, instead of just being, and by the way, it started off with a snarky comment because they're like, we know you loved our MLS power ranking so much. We thought we'd give you an MVP. There was that same snark again that I think gets them in more trouble when it, all they'd really have to do is educate. Again, they have very smart people over there and mm -hmm. it would be nice to hear some of them talk. And yeah. like explain why they're picking this or why they're doing that instead of some snarky comment and you know that, that comes out of it. But for here, for Chicharito, I understand why they put him as number one. That's fine. They give a reasoning. You know, that's great. You know, they're, they're talking about the narrative, and I don't know if narrative should be part of a power ranking, but it is. And so, you know, hey, you you have the pressure. The, the people are talking about the story. They're talking about what you're doing. And you're, you're performing. So I have no problems with him being one, number one. I'd rank him number two uh, whenever you look at this. But yeah, I mean, they have some, you know, some of the best names in the league are on this. It's I, I think picking a top five is a fairly easy, mundane way for them to go about this and, and sort of keep that rolling throughout the time. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't have any problems with this. Number one was Chicharito. Then you had uh, Rua Diaz. You had Carlos Gill from um, from New England. Uh, Christian Roldan from Seattle. And uh, Rubio Rubin. Um, where does he play for? I'm trying to remember. I had it down and then RSL. I... RSL. Yeah, thank you. He does. He plays for RSL. Um, and so, you know, a bunch of Western Conference uh, uh, opponents in there. Not not surprised. Yeah, if you, if you look at the uh, supporter shield standings, you know, that's majority of Western conference teams sitting at the top there. So it makes sense that, um, you know, a lot of these candidates would come from, from Western conference teams. I think th it's a funny that you bring up Rui Diaz. And I think this comes up in the MVP conversation every year and there's no wrong answer, which is kind of the beauty of it is do you pick the best player from the best team? Because obviously the best team needs to be rewarded. And so whoever is the leader of that team or the best player on that team should be recognized. Or there's the argument that I like to use, which is most valuable to the team, meaning if you pluck them out of the team, where would that team be? And I think that's, that's with that argument, Chicharito definitely deserves to be number one, because if you take away his seven goals, where are the Galaxy right now? Right. Uh, and so to say he's the most valuable player to a team, he is the most valuable player to the Galaxy. And if you were to take him away and replace him with second in line, I don't know that you get the same production um you know, with an Ethan Zubak or an you, Augie you know. Williams or, or who, <laughs> you know, making those run the same type of runs and putting right. himself in the same positions. I don't think you get that with, uh, you know, with the backup to Chicharito than you do with Chicharito. So I think in that regard, he is the most valuable player uh, in the league right now. And just the fact that he's, he's in the conversation. I know you said narrative maybe shouldn't have to play with it. Um, by the end of the season, we'll, we'll see how this pans out. And if maybe the hot start fades a little bit and maybe he just comes down to earth, but if it continues, I think, the narrative, you know, it does it does play into it because this is the most expensive player in the league, someone who had a really, you know, bit of a tragic season last season, and to see him coming out like this, I think everyone's talking about it. It's 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 the talk of the town. It's the buzz. It's happening right now, and so I think he he deserves to be at the front of that list as the season goes on. We'll see if he stays up there, but I think for the initial rankings, he's been the most valuable. He scored the most goals. It, it's the best narrative to put it number one. So it checks all the boxes. So I'm okay with it. Maybe by the end of the season. Ru Rui Diaz will have a better resume overall, but right. for right now, I think Chicharito is the correct answer at number one. Um, yeah, I have, I have no problems with it, and uh, I won't really argue uh, uh, that much. Uh, by the way, Chris in the chat room says, a uh, rumor of Pavone back to L.A. Um, he says, we're on fire today, again in Argentina. So, yeah, they were starting to, everything was starting to build. Um, I don't know what has changed that would make anybody think that, you know, this is going on. I think we've talked about it. There is no update. There is no, everything is being investigated, but that investigation is is private. It's not, it's not open to everybody. Um, and so you know, really, we won't know anything until we know something. And it could take a year. It could take two years. Um, it's a very long, drawn out process. But something would have to change with that in order for all of that to happen. So, uh, Eric, do you mind uh, Do you mind just talking to everybody for a second while I try to get our guests on the phone? I mean, I'm, I would ch thought about I was going to be all sneaky about it, but there's really no point to it. Just all right. Throw it right out there. Well, yeah. I'll address the, the Pavone thing. Um, you know, just going back to what conversations we had about Christian Pavone. Uh, if you remember when his dad went on the radio station in Argentina, he mentioned that his contract will be up. 
uh, with Boca Juniors at the end of the year in December, I believe, is when he said it was going to be up. So um, it makes sense that maybe Christian Pavone and his family are maybe planning for a move beyond Boca Juniors after this season. Right now, obviously, with his contract, he's tied to that team. He's connected to that team. He's going to you know, finish out that contract. But maybe his agent and uh, th those around him know that he enjoyed his time with the LA Galaxy. He had success with the LA Galaxy. So it could be that um, you know, after his contract is up with Boca Juniors, that there's a path back. So obviously, right now, when we talk about roster construction, all three designated player um, slots are taken. Salary-wise, you know, you, you'd have to a little bit of magic so it probably isn't a move for this summer or that would happen this season but down the line if some other designated players do move on uh then it did there i think that would open the door for maybe christian to pavone to come back and then of course uh that's of course with all the caveat um regarding you know the investigation and everything that needs to you know be cleared out and finish up uh to get resolved as well so when you look at it that way, to give a year for all that to be resolved and for the contract to play out, right. maybe there is a path back, but maybe it's just not right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely could be. All right, well, we're, we're lucky enough, and I think if I hit all the right buttons and we did all the right things, uh, that we're joined by uh, LA Galaxy General Manager, Mr. Dennis DeClosa, coming back on the show. Dennis, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you well. Great. Thank How are you? you? We're, we're doing great. Thanks for taking some time. I know uh, I know you're a busy guy. I saw your your Instagram story this morning that said your, your phone was, was <laughs> overheating. Yeah, I've never seen this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was of, of being, I don't know if it was of being too busy or, I don't know, but it was an awkward uh, thing. The whole, the, the call fell off and it did, this came up. I don't know, it's interesting. I, you know, I know it's all those deals that you're trying to uh, to put together. I'm, I'm sure that's what it is. So uh, I, I, it doesn't surprise me at all. But I mean, I, I want to start, Dennis, and just sort of talk about um, the construction that, that you and the rest of the team have, have put together so far in this season. I mean, um, there's a whole bunch of new faces here. You guys are, are and I'll call it mining, uh, you know, League Two over in, <laughs> over in France a little bit. Um, just just for the talent that's there, and and I know Kevin has talked to uh, to Yovan about you know sort of you guys see some value there, but I mean it, it does seem strange to be so focused on that. What what's what is your, you know, what did you guys think whenever you you got to see League Two players and then then sort of realize that there could be deals being made there? Well, I think the, um, to be honest, that the whole transfer market everywhere, uh, including here in the U.S which is a different, obviously, from a different perspective as, a, as an internal market, but overall, like the international transfer market has changed a lot. And uh, there's a few things that, that obviously uh, go into as an argument. One is probably the, the lack of uh, finances and economics and, and everything that uh, that is related to the pandemic that were hopefully step-by-step uh, walking away from and little by little hopefully in a safe way and a good way we can uh, uh, come to a more like normal presence which also means that if if that happens like a normal transfer market would be uh, would be more at the horizon at the moment there's a lot of clubs that are struggling a lot of clubs that are obviously looking for to uh, to shrink in their their rosters now we're in a different position but I, I do think it's in a combination of quality, opportunity, uh, our manager's knowledge of, of playing in France and, and having done his education and, and being obviously very much aware of, of market there and the opportunity of, of uh, signing certain players with a certain standard of, of quality makes it an interesting market. Now also we, uh, we've been through this roster construction now not only the last few weeks or the only last few players as, as you've seen that for example we brought in Jorge Villafaña from Portland right uh, Jonathan Bond from West Brom which has been a long uh, transfer and a long discussion with uh, with his former club and, and with him uh, obviously Derek Williams from Blackburn which has been a long time in the works even uh, before Greg was here with a whole lot of issues on the discovery lists and, mm -hmm. and what some more. Um, not so much the, the bringing in new players, but obviously uh, the opportunity for young players to come on uh, different contracts and, and walking into a first team roster. And then obviously the players that have been added to the roster lately, which uh, in a transfer free status and with the abilities to sign players here uh, and and authority scouted make good sense. 
Hi, Dennis. This is uh, Eric Vieira. I'm uh, Josh's other co-host here. So thank you for taking some time just to Hi, kind yeah. of follow follow up with with Josh's question about uh, you know mining a little bit in France. So uh, it seems like <laughs> there's been kind of a, a concerted effort there without possibly showing all your cards. Uh, you know, is this team construction uh, you know looking at other avenues as well outside of uh, you know the French league? I know they've brought in some other players, but is this team done or is there still more? Uh, you know, more players coming in possibly from other leagues outside of France. Yeah, there could be. Um, first of all, we're trying to keep an eye on on all kinds of leagues. I think personally, I have a lot of good contacts in in both Central and South America uh, in Europe. Um, we're trying to uh, get more depth charts and and think ahead of the process. So obviously, in certain positions. Throughout a long season, you need depth and you need cover. I think one of the, the better examples in, in MLS, for example, Seattle, they have cover and a lot of depth in their in their roster and that, that makes them even go through rough stretches or stretches where there's a lot of players that are called up by the, by the national teams or in our case, for example, a long absence of, of for example, Jonathan Dos Santos most likely on the Gold Cup roster or, right. or Sebastian Lediet and those those things need to be covered and need to be added. And, and uh, an important cover piece, uh, actually forgot to mention that was, is for example, Victor Vasquez, who is more than capable than uh, starting for us, but also obviously uh, giving quality when in different positions people lack that. And those are the things that are sometimes hard to pen out or to plan or to even program because you're basically uh, before a season, obviously trying to, uh, guess when when players should come in. Uh, overheard a little bit of a, a discussion you had with, uh, for example, Christian Pavon or these kind of discussions. So, and, and those are continuous discussion. These are not like pen to tomorrow, and our depth charts are not now to bring in tomorrow another two or three guys. And when you have players coming in. It does need some time to adapt it. It does need some time to, to get used to the new league, to their new environment, to their living, to everything. We were actually discussing it internally the other day. I, I think for some of the players to have very, very high expectations, is, first of all, is more than fair because of where they come from and also because of where they come at with with our club and, and, and what we represent and what the expectations are. But yeah, you, you don't have to forget also that they're human beings and they're coming into another culture. And for example, it took us forever to get some of these guys even on visas and right. appointments and the little little things that add to a, uh, the whole equation of obviously building a roster and having a new coaching staff. I think overall we've had a lot of changes, which uh, so far have been positive, very much positive and positively re received. But uh, also, certain things need a little bit of time and need a little bit of uh, support and and, uh, and help to, to get settled and, and to show their best. Dennis, is there is there a strategy in in you know I, I know we're talking about France and stuff like that, but is there a strategy to getting guys together from a certain region? Like you know you, you go out and get you know Sam Grand Sierra, um, you bring in Kevin Cabral, um, you know you're you're able to get these these guys from you know at least that speak a common language. Is there is there a benefit in your guys' mind to bringing you know four players from France over at a time instead of maybe just one and and perhaps isolating that player? Is it better when there's you know other uh, a, a different way to say it is like they have a bunch of friends. They speak the same language. They're all sort of going through this, you know, experience of 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 discovery with with Major League Soccer. Does that factor into it? No, no, as a primary factor. I think the primary factor here is that that Greg has a pretty clear profile in his head for each position, what it should look like, and characteristics and personality, uh, typical technical aspects and and, and physical aspects. And that makes it easier to to fill in names, and the discussions are always very open, very transparent, and very uh, very much geared to to doing the best for the club with everybody that we have available and everybody that can uh, um, can support this and, and can obviously uh, add to the equation. Now, that makes it easier if you're looking for a a midfielder or a right winger or a left winger, what are the exact characteristics and how does the coach obviously 
see these guys in a player profile. Now, I must say that somebody coming from abroad and finding a fellow teammate that speaks the same language does make it easy. But on the other hand, we're also very active on uh, having people do language classes, try to integrate them as much as possible. Our team administrator and, and people around them, they do an enormous and, and very good job on, on trying to uh, get them adapted as much as possible. Even little things like your driver's license, your social security, whatever. There's so many things that go into it. In the meantime, they're expected to perform and they're expected to be play at their highest level. So little things do do help. And the, the more we can help, the more we can support, um, I think the better it is. Now, on the other hand, it is not like a, a, a specific tactic to bring in guys from the same region or, or we, need, we just need the best players available and hopefully we do and uh, to be honest doesn't really matter where they come from to be honest or how they look like or what their uh, ideas they need to perform for the galaxy it's an unique a new opportunity to play for a team like this in LA and to be honest we're glad that the ones that we have and, and there's a lot that like I said it's a lot of obviously new faces with Jonathan, Derek, Jorge, uh, Victor, uh, Samuel Granzier, Cabral, and then the other two that we're still waiting for. Yep. Yeah. So you, you mentioned you kind of rattled off all of the the new signings so far, but the the players who have a little bit more tenure, uh, who have been there, they have mentioned in some of the media calls that the atmosphere this season is different uh, in the locker room. They said that there's a different feeling. Uh, is there a different feeling in the offices down the hall on off the field on your end? Do you have a, a different feeling uh, this season with how things have been going so far? Well, I think obviously results and a, and a positive preseason help to a positive feeling. But in the end, I think also what we've uh, hopefully achieved and what we're trying to support Greg is that when he comes in new with the authority that he has, that he obviously can set a tone for for certain aspects that in, in some occasions they seem very uh, common sense, like communication and clear guidance and clear rules and clear expectations and responsibilities. But then it's up to obviously people that, that surround the team to, to implement it and to nurture it every day. Culture and identity, that th those can be very hollow terms if, if you don't follow up on it and if you don't really live them through. So uh, to have a good ambience and a good atmosphere, that is a very big, big credit to Greg and his staff and everybody that surrounds the team and the whole uh, plan of, of uh, being in LA, going to Arizona, going away actually for preseason and being more together and getting to know each other better, uh, having some good games where players and, and uh, people can be tested. I thought it was uh, a big plus and, and something that I I think was very good from our, the current staff that when young players have to play that there was always like a big emphasis on how to make them better and, and be positive about it in, instead of looking at the players that were absent. Now, when the absent players started to get in, they they weren't given their uh, spot automatically back, so they had to win it also. And that, I think, creates good internal competition. It, it creates some good spirit of, of the best players have an opportunity and that there is opportunities for play and that you're not thrown in one game and then six games not as a young player. And there is some quality and things start to grow and it grows into a culture and it grows into an identity, but it needs time and it needs a lot of nurturing and it needs a lot of, a lot of uh, effort and energy. And that's why there's obviously a lot of people um, around the team that, that, uh, that take care of that. And then to be honest, it's, a, it's, a, it's good to hear from the players that they feel that the atmosphere is good and that the atmosphere is, uh, is at a good place point in a moment so for us it's the responsibility and our obligation to keep it like that or to even make it better and to, to create even more opportunities for our young players to integrate our new players as best as we can and to cherish and to improve our, our settled players or the players that have been for a long time. Now, Dennis, you were mentioning uh, some of the younger players. I, I have one in particular, and it's only because I've been I get this question asked every time uh, LA Galaxy two plays a game. Um, but can you tell us? Is you know we saw a lot of Cuevas in in the in the preseason, at least for you know a couple games there, and then he sort of seemed to disappear, and we're not seeing him down with LA Galaxy two. Is there anything going on with with Cuevas? Or uh, I, I know you and I have had this conversation before, but I figured I'd ask you so that way people would stop asking me. 
No, nothing special. Something that I think is a, is a, is a technical decision and the players that are uh, at the moment being uh, being supported in, in, in their development and uh, nothing else, nothing really, uh, nothing really much about it, to be honest. Okay, perfect. All right, so that that mean, that means I'm sure I won't get any more questions on that. I, that I, I I always get more questions. That's okay. That, that that's fine. Um, you know, when we look and at also to say that Mauricio is a very talented player, obviously, and it's a player that has been a long time at the at the Galaxy, and hopefully will stay here for a long time. But it's it's something that obviously he needs to he needs to decide upon, and he needs to make his mind up, and and for sure that uh, he should see that that the opportunities that are have been. Uh, handed out to to some of his teammates or or players are in the same age group mm -hmm. at a team like the galaxy where the expectations are pretty high and the standard is pretty high uh, the opportunities have been and are there for young players and it's always something that i've been like advocating for but also i'm now very proud of that that some of these kids really step up and, and can contribute yeah what in a the... team that actually functions yeah, on a team that's always always a good thing as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that helps. <laughs> I, I was going to say it does because because we, we saw sort of you know uh, certainly people who've been watching the galaxy for a long time saw you know sort of the advancement of the younger players in 2017 and how perhaps that wasn't very well backed up in a lot of ways. And so then, you know, unfortunately, we were just talking about this actually before we, we talked with you, is how fleeting careers can be in professional soccer. And there needs to be luck and there needs to be skill and there needs to be perseverance and all these other things. But sometimes things completely out of your control can can sort of take you away from the game. And, and that's it. That was the one shot. Yeah, it is difficult. I've seen, obviously, I've been years and years and years involved in youth development seen the last step from like being a very very promising young player to to a full-blown professional and that's the biggest step and there's a lot of obstacles and there's a lot of distractions along the way and you have to be very strong and it, it's not always talent it's it's a lot of uh, hard work and, and a lot of character and personality that that supports the talent or that that basically uh, even could overtake the 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 importance of talent in, in in some occasions now you need to be very very talented obviously right. as a soccer player to make it as a professional but i i do think that uh right mindset character personality honesty uh, resilience and all these words and feeling part of of, of 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 being a team player and sometimes setting your own interest a little bit on the side for for the common interest make it uh make it interesting for for uh, to look at these young players and to be honest i i have no idea what what was the exact situation in 2017 as you know i started in 2019 right i do i do think that at any club that is uh considered as a big club like we consider ourselves and as, and as we are perceived it is not easy for young players to step on the field I and mean, it's not easy to develop into a in, in a starter and to make an impact even and and sometimes we need to be very careful with the steps they make so we need to develop them in the right way and sometimes we need to be um, a little bit more looking at in, in in a critical way also the pathway leading up to be a professional how our, uh, our competition structures are and how much uh, real challenging games uh, some of these players get before they actually uh, turn into professionals and that makes it easier for them. I, I do think, for example, our second team in the last, no, certainly last year and, and also this year has shown that it's a good place for uh, for them to develop and it gives them already a little bit of a sense of, of uh, difficulty, how difficult it could be on, on a professional level. Right. And like you said, it, the, the chances are given sporadically sometimes and sometimes for right or for wrong they're not even handed out so easily also and there's a lot of competition there's an ability to bring in players from abroad there's an ability to bring in players from within mls the uh, the need for for results and everything sometimes make it a little bit harder for young players so that the the ones that are currently playing and and to be honest the braveness of of of, of our coaching staff to put them in sometimes in difficult moments we saw against lafc or uh, new york those are really good learning moments and really good uh really good 
you know, I would say games or periods of time that they're on the field for them to further develop. Yeah. And that makes in, in, in a while and, and there's nothing that can be said also about last year or the year, the year before it's obviously, uh, it, it already spoke very high of, of Guillermo to put Efrain on, the, and on his, uh, on his first game, actually his first official game. Right. And, and to have an eye for that talent is, uh, is obviously very good. And it added a lot to the, to the club in the last two years. And I think now the ability of Greg to go into uh, the space of development and to be connected with some of the goals of the club to, to further develop young players is, is very much appreciated. Yeah, well, well, Dennis, we've uh, we've kept you on long enough. I know that uh, periodically we can check in with you, so I'm sure we'll have you back on. Uh, we appreciate the time, and uh, hopefully we'll see you out at the uh, the stadium on Saturday, and certainly uh, with a lot of people being able to come back into the stadium on uh, on June 19th, uh, I'm sure you'll have a lot more uh, people to say hi to. Yeah, I'm very excited about, uh, first of all, a uh, game on, on Saturday. As, as, as you know, this is a very, very big opponent and, uh, and probably one of the, classic rivalries, which I think we should cherish on, on one end, but also really defend our, our home field mm -hmm. and and very uh, happy and, and hopefully see a lot of uh, fans back when uh, when when we were able to receive them against uh, Seattle, for sure. It, it'll, be a, it'll be a good time. Thanks, Dennis. We appreciate it. As always, take, take, uh, take some time with the family for tonight, and we'll talk to you again, all right? Thank you. Have a good evening. All right. Thanks, Dennis. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bye -bye. Dennis. All right, there you go. Uh, LA Galaxy General Manager, Mr. Dennis DeClosa, joining us here on Corner of the Galaxy. I would like to point out a little a little course correction I think that we we could all agree happened during that. Uh, certainly on the Cuevas thing, um, the idea that he needs to make up his mind and decide where he wants to play, I think is maybe tells you a little bit more of the situation than everybody else uh, mm -hmm. sort of has. Well, you know, the, at least there's some shades there of something going on. So, <laughs> you know, I... I I have talked to Dennis on occasion, um, you know, about some of this stuff. And so I, you know, I can try, always try to share as much information as I have. Um, but Dennis is, is just as open with you here on the podcast as he is whenever I talk to him. There's no difference. He doesn't tell me things, uh, you know, in, in between. So, uh, you know, at least for me, I think that's interesting. Um, talking about Christian Fafone, just talking about uh, the time it takes to gather all these deals together. And, and, and like you said, um, or, or like he said, was talking, you know, he's making deals for next year too, right? Yeah. You have to set those balls in motion now if you're going to do it. I thought that was, that was one of the, the things that, you know, I, I'm glad he was listening to uh, what we were saying while you were setting him up uh, with the Pavon thing, because it's one of those things, do you bring Pavon up? Do you not bring, bring Pavon up? But the fact that he was candid and mentions that, you know, those conversations stay open. He mentioned it with Williams. He mentioned it with Bond, that this isn't something that happened overnight. This is These are conversations that are ongoing, and they're keeping on the discovery list. And, and I think just one of the great things about Dennis, whenever you have him on to talk, is you ask him that question about Cuevas, and that just, and he had an answer, and he knew knew how to elaborate and what was going on. This isn't someone who's it's first team or bust. He's top to bottom, the whole program. He's yes. got eyes and ears and figuring out, you know, developing the whole system and the playing, getting the youngsters in, in addition to bringing in, you know, your designated players and your, your veterans, uh, you know, it, it's, there's a lot of wheels in motion uh, and the fact that he's able to keep tabs on it. And it's, it's like a warm blanket having DTK on it just feels nice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, he knows it all. Um, and I think that's what he did with, you know, with the Federation of Mexico as well. So, you know, he really had his hands on all those different buttons. And so he can push those buttons. He can do that stuff. So anyway, it was great having Dennis on. Um, I, I would like to just point out it takes like a text message to get it, get anything set up with with Dennis. It's just like you send it over and he's like, yes, I can do it. No, I can't. And then you're you're good to go. So he was uh, nice enough to come on the show uh, today and uh, and talk to us a little bit. So I hope you guys found that interesting. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to go now from the high of talking to Dennis to closer to sort of the the lows of professional sports um, and the the racial abuse and death threats that Derek Williams uh, has been receiving. Uh, I believe it's mostly on Instagram. I think he has an Instagram account. I believe that's where most of this is happening. I don't know if he has a Facebook account and that's how where it's going as well. I don't know if he has a Twitter account. I don't think he does, or at least not one that he uses on a regular basis so i'm i'm talking mostly about instagram on this but uh, ever since the tackle on andy polo Derek williams has been receiving death threats racial abuse on his social media platforms uh, i'm told at least anecdotally uh that most of these seem to be coming from peru 
Um, and Andy Polo is a Peruvian national team player. Um, he has played on their team. He is somebody who I think that they were looking forward to. I, I'm not going to say he's a huge part of their team, but he is a part of their team. And, and certainly that's the thing. Um, so you're seeing most of these, these threats and, and, and the names, uh, coming from, from these fans, uh, and the LA galaxy, I reached out to the LA galaxy. Obviously they said they're aware of the abuse Williams has been receiving and they're working with the social media companies and the league in order to help Williams out in that capacity, however they can do it. So, uh, this is sort of the dark side of everything that's been going on. And, you know, unless you've been living under a rock, um, then you, 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 uh, you know, that obviously the tackle on, on Andy Polo, uh, the red card, and then what we're expecting to be a multi-game suspension. Now, um, the time frame on that suspension, Eric is like totally up in the air, right? Because, yeah. uh, basically he's already suspended for this game. Right. And then the galaxy yeah. don't play again until, until, uh, June 19th. So they have until basically the week before June 19th to really come down and out with any of their, um, out with any of their, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And, and their decision. And, and, and we saw how long it took with Sebastian Legette, you know, for their decision to come out on how long his suspension was going to be. They let him play a game and then they came out with the decision after the fact. Uh, so you, we know that they, they like to take their time uh, when they do, dole out these punishments. But, but you're right, um, you know, about the racial abuse and the harassment. Um, we, we saw it that afternoon. And that, that's, that's the unfortunate part is you, you can see this coming from a mile away that, you know, the hard, the hardest thing about this, I think, is is been the tackle itself, uh, because I don't think anyone I've seen is defending the tackle itself. Although uh, it was, I, I felt like you almost got accused of defending, the, <laughs> I did of get defending accused, the tackle, yeah. but I'm like nowhere in anywhere has anybody yeah. said that that is a cool tackle, and and yeah. I think that's the big one of the biggest like sort of I'm going to stand on this soapbox is that well I can't believe you're defending the tackle. Nobody's defending the yeah. tackle. It's a very bad tackle. It's not one you want to see ever happen in a game. Yeah, exactly. So, so in my grading the galaxy piece, you know, obviously Derek Williams, you know, got bottom of the list. Uh, and I said that there was an overreaction to the tackle and some, some Portland fans maybe took ex exception to that, you know, word. But when, when I talk about that, I was talking about the overreaction, people calling for him to be put in jail, uh, people, you know, saying that it was disgusting, calling him, you know, animal, just these, these certain names that, that are coded and, and it kind of has a racial tinge to it. And so when you see those things happening, you know, then you see the racial harassment and you see the the bullying online and what's going on. It's like, okay, well, of course that kind of set itself up. And so that's where it came from. But I, I also called the, the tackle woefully mistimed. I did yep. call it a grisly collision. So yes. I don't think there was any, you know, shade as far as me defending the tackle. It, it was an ugly tackle. It was mistimed. It, it was, it was ugly, you know? And so it's not about defending the tackle. It's about the reaction to it and some members, prominent members of, you know, soccer media. And so that's, that's the benefit and the, the, the curse uh, of social media is, you know, everyone gets to, to share their thoughts immediately and, and not, they're not always going to be great. But when you have, you know, members of the media like Stu Holden, you know, saying that this is, you know, unacceptable, the player shouldn't see the field, the field again you know, until the field Polo again, comes back. Until yeah. Polo comes back. Then you have, you know, Merritt Paulson, you know, who I was having some interactions with saying that, you know, he shouldn't see the field for a long time. He called it disgusting. Uh, and then of course, when the harassment comes out, then they say this shouldn't be happening. And then of course they say, but the tackle was bad. And then of course, Merritt Paulson, but there was still one of the worst tackles I've ever seen in 10 years. It's like, well, are, are you saying the harassment is bad? Or are you saying, or are you defending that, you know, that we have to talk about the tackles? You, you can't, you know, play both sides of the fence here. They're, they're different things. And I think where it gets difficult is, you know, Derek Williams did shut down his comments on Instagram. So I think the screenshots that were found, the where you could pin two examples were from Peruvian national team fans or people right. from Peru. Those are two examples. But before he shut down the, the comments, we don't know where else they were coming from. And just some of the things that we saw from some Portland Timbers fans and some of the coded language that was being used, you know, maybe they maybe didn't say the words that get you in trouble, but there was definitely some some shading and the way that it was being talked about that kind of led it down that path that it's, you know, it, it's hard to have these discussions and it's uncomfortable to have these discussions because we've been dealing with this, you know, for 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 years in this country about, well, technically I didn't say that. I didn't say this. You know, you're you're being soft, cancel culture, that you get the whole the whole, you know, you know, turnaround on 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 you know trying to flip it back at you and the gaslighting part of it. But but when you really look at things, you know, had this been a player, you know, like Nick Depew or Daniel Stairs, have they made this tackle? Would some of this language still be used? You know, and it's a thought experiment that we're unable to roll out. 
But, uh, you know, it just, it just makes you think some of those things and what responsibility do the Merritt Paulsons and the Stu Holdens of the world, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm small potatoes. You know, if I share something, you know, I, I share a lot of funny memes online. That's my thing. Uh, you know, every once in a while I'll, I'll share something seriously, but my reach is not as big as those two. So they have a, a higher responsibility with the words that they choose and doubling down and doubling, you know, defending certain things and saying some things are not okay, but re refusing to address some other issues, you know, they have a responsibility to take accountability for that too. And so that, that comes with the territory when you're someone of that stature. Yeah, it, it does. And by the way, um, and I think Greg Vanny did a good job of this as well. And, and this is tough because you really want to light into people for, for racially abusing Derek Williams. You really want to just lay into everybody who says anything about it, except that you know that on the other side of the field as well um, is, is another man, Andy Polo, who underwent surgery yesterday uh, to repair a left ruptured, ruptured quadriceps muscle and a torn meniscus. He is out for the rest of the year. I mean, and we know that. And Derek Williams knows that. And all of the reporters who are covering this and everything that they're looking for knows that, right? We all know these things. Um, and we're looking at this and we're saying, you know, yeah, we understand. And again, nobody's defending the tackle. That's not it. And everybody feels horrible for Andy Polo. I I, I never want to see anybody Absolutely. lose a year of That's their of their career. I mean, it's it could be career threatening. We don't know how he's ever coming back. All those things. Yeah. But the, the thing I can't handle is that we have been through a similar situation. It's not the same because when you look at the injuries that actually happened, they're, they're night and day different, right? Darlington Nagby and Nigel de Jong, we went through this, right? We saw it. Uh, Nigel yeah. de Jong absolutely went for the ball. He missed the ball and went over the top of it, and he got Darlington Nagby's uh, ankle. And we all saw it, and everybody saw the picture. And that picture was more damaging than any replay that has ever mm -hmm. been replayed, right? And that's the picture everybody was showing. And they tried to do this again with Williams and Polo. What did we learn from that is the picture doesn't tell the story. Watch the video. The video's horrible. It's bad. But what you can also see from the video is that Derek Williams was absolutely locked in on the ball, was trying to go to the ball, and he the ball even goes through his legs. What he did was try to pull out of that tackle. He actually pulls his legs up in order to try to protect himself from colliding with Andy Polo. There's a collision there. There's no malice here. There was nothing but mistimed. It's mistimed horribly. And Greg Vanny was talking about that today. Um, and so I, I just, I think that, you know, we have to be careful with how we describe these things and how we look at these things. And certainly on Twitter, um, Somebody in the Discord was talking about how Twitter is basically only made for bad things anymore, right? It's it's just this place. It's a cesspool of things and stuff like that. I'm like, you know, Twitter was a great place at one point. And, you know, for the first three, four years of it being there, you had interactions with people you had no business interacting with um, for a while, right? Movie stars, professional <laughs> athletes. You could get in there. You could get in their stuff, Eric. You could, you could be... Yeah. Owners of professional sports teams. Yeah, <laughs> I was, I was going to say, you, you have that one all the time, apparently. Yeah, um, but yeah. but I, I will counterpoint. Here, here, here's, here's my time here. Twitter also is a good place. You know, you've seen the community that's built up in recent years and people making friends and people building connections and finding common interests, you know. So there's a good part of it. And I think it's just it's just with anything. And so I, I know Twitter sometimes gets a, a lot of flack for for the snark and and, and I'm right there with, with you and, and complaining. Uh, you know, and it is accessible for a lot of things, but you know, YouTube's accessible for a lot of things. Facebook is accessible for a lot of things. Any any there's good and bad sides to everything. So uh, I think you know saying that Twitter exclusively is the worst uh, you know, isn't fair without acknowledging, you know, the suite as well. There, there's, there's good things going on as well. It's just, there is that side of it also. And I think it's fair to point that out, but you know, I also want to share the other side because that's the hammers move, uh, that, you know, there, there's benefits and good things. And part of the community that we've built, uh, you know, around the galaxy community has been through Twitter and through Instagram. Uh, and so it's, I just want to point that out also. Yeah, there, there are goods, there are bads, there are a whole bunch of different things um, whenever you look at all of these things. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's that's what you have to look at. That's what you have to say. So, yeah, I think there's some responsibility within the media to, to be responsible. I did a podcast right after um, the Nigel de Jong, um, you know, uh, incident. And I remember talking and we were all talking as if, you know, Nigel de Jong had broken Darlington Nagby's, you know, leg. And I regret doing that podcast because, you know, everything felt like that was this big moment, um, in that. And when you go back and look at it, it was, it wasn't, and I think we just need some perspective here. Now, again, we've talked about this multiple times, um, Eric, and that is that the result here is worse. 
The result here is worse. Andy yeah. Polo is out, and we know that. Uh, Greg Vanny talking today in the media conference call. And by the way, all of our the entire media conference call, Eric, is available on our YouTube or on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can find the entire thing there. You can listen to everything that Greg Vanny said because he talked about the mental stat status of Derek Williams. I think everybody's sort of a little worried about where Derek Williams is mentally right now. Um, he talked about how he could see it in his face, how he's wearing it heavily. Um, how he's wearing the stress heavily. And then you know Greg Vanny wanted to go studs up on all these people who were um who who are who are you know throwing this racial abuse at Derek and and doing all the stuff, the death threats, that type of thing. You know he wanted to go, but he was trying to keep it all in context, which is another guy, you know, the guy across the field isn't playing this year because of that tackle. Yeah. He he understands it. He's there, he gets it. So um, you know, I think that's where we let it uh, right now. Hopefully, uh, everybody you know can take a deep breath. Um, Andy Pola put out a a little statement today on his Instagram. Basically, said um, you know that he's he's thanking God that everything went well for giving me strength to continue for helping me never to lose space. Also, thanks to my family for being with me at all times. Thank you to my teammates, admins, medical staff, Timbers fans, and everyone who took the time to send a message of encouragement. I will only say that there is no time to regret, just to have a positive mind to recover as quickly as possible to do what I like the most. I send a big hug to all of you and may God bless you always. So uh, there's Andy Polo. We know that Derek Williams reached out to Andy Polo twice already once, uh, you know, during slash after that game. And then again, um, a little bit later, we know that Greg Vanny has, uh, has reached out to Giovanni Savarese um, as well to sort of, you know, give his best wishes to Derek Polo. The malice isn't here. Um, and Derek Williams should be suspended for two to three games. That's absolutely what deserves of a clumsy mistime tackle that hurts somebody in that way and puts that puts them in a dangerous position like that. That's it. That's that's yeah. where we're at. That's <laughs> and, that, and, yeah. And I'll I'll end it on this note. Just wishing Andy Polo a sweet speedy recovery and hope all goes well and that he's able to see the field again. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, no matter how competitive you are, you want to beat your opponents but you want to beat them on the field of play. You don't want to see players go out injured. Uh, you know, that, that's not how you want to see players go out. You want to beat, you want to beat your opponents, you know, 11 v 11 on the field, make the results count uh, and, you know, let the better team win. You don't want to, you know, take someone out and, and, and ruin their season and possibly ruin their career. So just wishing Andy Polo the best uh, at the end of the day, these are human beings like Dennis was saying on the call, you know, this is someone who's going to, you know, be in, probably some considerable considerable pain, have to do some rehab, have to get right again, learn to do some things again. So, uh, you know, just that that's a long road for a lot of people. Uh, if you're just a regular Joe, you know, sitting at home doing a podcast. So to be an athlete and to gain that back, that's that much harder to do. So, you know, wishing him the best uh, moving forward. We have we have like zero zero you know standing in all of this whenever we look at it right. This is professional athletes doing what they're doing and and you know that that hurts and and certainly I understand Portland's fans being upset about it. I don't have a problem with them being upset about it. I I do have a problem with with some of the other stuff that's going on. So um, obviously so hopefully Derek Williams can get uh, all set and all that abuse stops. It drops away and he's able to sort of you know heal himself. I know Greg says he feels so remorseful about it. It, um, and that he got his timing wrong. He said he thought the player was further away whenever he started his run, and he realized, well, you know, you know, yeah. Go ahead. That, that's something that when I rewatched the play, because I said, "Am I missing something?" You know, is it maybe I'm too close to it because I'm a Galaxy fan. I'm I'm labeling this an overreaction, but maybe it really was, you know, a, a head hunting horrible tackle. But when I went to rewatch the play, uh, you see Williams going for it, and then uh, Polo comes out of play out of frame. And so when you watch it on the replay where he's coming from, Polo takes a beeline and, you know, part of that's why he's a good player. He was sprinting and going full speed to try to get that ball that maybe, you know, could have been a 50, you know, obviously it was close to being a 50-50 ball. He ended up, uh, you know, getting there first. So, you know, he, he came in quickly also. So it's not like, you know, he was a sitting duck and just waiting. And uh, I saw a comparison to the the Brian Mullen challenge on Steve Zakawani. That was, that was a head hunting. That was the player there. And then another player coming and just cleaning out. This is two players players going for a ball and so yes. I, I think that's what made it different that's why it was violent that's why it looked awful and that's why the end result was awful is because they were both going for the ball and so i think that needs to be stated as well it would sound like polo was just sitting there and got cleaned out they were both going full speed you know he heavy and that that's what caused the heavy collision um, to, uh, to go on to a little bit more of the media call. Um, I thought it was, you know, obviously Greg talked about that. Um, one of the big and, and more, I said the lighthearted breaking news of all this, cause obviously there were some heavy moments with talking about Derek Williams and talking about Andy Polo and, and what was happening there. Uh, the lighthearted version of this is that, uh, is that Greg Vanny started watching, uh, Ted Lasso. So he watched the first episode. He has seen it, Eric. Um, he now says that he needs to stop being so cheap. 
um, <laughs> and, and actually get a, uh, a a login uh, for all of that. So um, that's that's yeah. Can can the LA Galaxy maybe afford to to give like Greg a, a login or something like that? <laughs> Yeah, but what what, is, what were the contract negotiations? Let's, let's talk to get Dennis back on the line. He can't get him an an Apple Plus. Yeah, you, know, you get it. You get it for free when you when you buy a new device. Get him a new laptop. You know, there's there's workarounds to this. That's right. We 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 can we can work this out. Uh, it was funny. Chris Glidden, who's running the the call for the LA Galaxy, was like, uh, anybody in the chat room who has an extra login, please go ahead and and put it in there. <laughs> uh, so that way so that way Greg can watch his uh, his stuff there. So yeah, um, you know there was that. I, I think it was interesting. Greg Vanny talked about the home field advantage. Uh, Kevin asked about you know how important is the home field advantage uh you know for you and he goes listen we want to take maximum points at home we want teams to come in here to think they've already lost when they come into dignity health sports park i love just hearing that being said um such an underrated part of this and by the way this year traveling teams have not fared well right we know yeah. that uh, traveling teams have not fared well they're not doing well um so the home field advantage is a real thing and i think that greg vanny is is intent on keeping that now uh larry morgan uh, ext uh, uh extraordinaire was out there doing some research today and since bruce arena's first full season larry says the la galaxy are 110 44 and 42 at home um and so uh, can you repeat that yeah 110 44 and okay. 42 so 110 wins 44 losses 42 draws at home which is a significant home field advantage and i don't know how that ranks against other people's win percentages and stuff like that but we know that you know like for instance in 2011 the la galaxy were undefeated at home 12 0 and 5 in, in, yeah. in 2011 uh we know in 2017 they were horrible 3 That's 9 <laughs> and 5 in in 2017 right um you go to the mls cup winning years of 2012 uh 10 6 and 1 uh, which is interesting. I'm pretty sure that the uh, that the home games were front logged in that, and yeah. the LA Galaxy started out slowly, and then they built up momentum on the backside, yeah. basically in this in the middle of the season for that second one. So even the six losses is a lot to to sort of uh, they, see in that one. That that team peaked at the right time. That's they a did. classic classic peaked at the right time year. Um, they were 12, one and four, by the way, only one loss at home in 2014. So that home field advantage is a pretty significant indicator of whether or not you're going to be a successful team, which by also, duh, I mean, that's one of those <laughs> things. It's like, Oh, if you win all your but, home games, you know, but at the same, at the same token, that's something that in recent years hasn't happened. And so when you, that's why I asked you to repeat that number. Cause you know, that that's a really nice record, which, what you rolled out there. And that just hasn't been what we've seen in recent seasons. So the fact that that's, Greg Vanny is actually saying that out loud and that it needs to happen and needs to be a thing, uh, you know, is great to hear. Also, when Dennis was on the call mentioning, you know, San Jose and how it's a, it's a classic rivalry and that you need to come out and get points for that. Uh, you know, this is something that, you know, you like to hear on the front of the minds of the front office of your head coach. And I think the the wild card in this is you know, the, the attendance starting to open up, you know, we, we saw it in uh, Madison square garden with the, the New York Knicks finally getting, you know, into the playoffs. It's been a long time and they won a game and the <laughs> people were just, they didn't know what to do with themselves because, you know, with the COVID year that we've had and with, you know, so many years since success for them, people just went wild. I think that dignity health sports park, once, you know, capacity opens up, People have been pent up. People want to go back. People want to celebrate. Sports have not been the same without fans. You're seeing it with a limited capacity, how much better it is with fans in the fans in the seats. So now once things start to open up, I think you're going to see a wild, wild crowds. I think the noise is going to be great. I think it's going to be something that, you know, it can it can be a real advantage. You know, I, I think I was seeing on social media that sections of, of season tickets were selling out in certain areas of the stadium uh, because people want to be there. People are ready. Are, and so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, Dignity Health Sports Park become a, a bit of a fortress again, because I, I think I think that's a bit of a wild card is, is you're going to have that stadium rocking probably like it hasn't been in, in five, five, six, seven years. Ah, uh, again, I mean, you know, the, uh, the, the red hot, you know, 1920s, um, you know, sort of the, this, this great party that was had after the great flus yeah. in, in 1917 <laughs> and 1918. Right. Um, you know, maybe we're headed to, towards that. Right. Yeah. So, um, that's yeah. why it's, 
we're, we're vaxxed. We did what we were supposed to. Let's go. We're let's vaxxed. Go. We're waxed. Let's get going. Let's get, let's rock and roll. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's get it going. So I, I, I feel that a hundred percent. Um, just a reminder, Sebastian Legette out, um, this weekend. Um, and that is because he's in Switzerland in one of those cities, um, in Switzerland that we were talking about earlier, uh, with the U S men's national team. He also stays gone for, for most of this international break as well. So, uh, Sebastian Legette should be, uh, should be very busy. And you heard Dennis talking about Jonathan Dos Santos and getting called in the gold cup for Mexico. Um, all these things are starting to go up. I asked Greg today, you know, just talking about the absences and the things that are going to have to sort of shift around, um, in order to fill and you know, how important is it to have confidence with the guys you're bringing in and how important is for the team to have confidence with the guys bringing in? Uh, he had a really good answer for that. I, I, again, I implore you to listen to the entire media call. Yes. Um, sometimes they can drone on. I think we were fairly succinct, uh, today. It seemed like everybody was getting to the point. We we're asking the good questions, uh, updates on, uh, on, uh, Sega Koulibaly. Uh, so Greg Vanny said that basically his, his visa appointment was done. They're just, he's just waiting to get his his passport back with the stamp on it that has the visa on it and then he can go uh that should mean that he should be leaving here in the next few days okay so that's basically where we're at and and, and where we're going now the interesting thing is is on the uh uh revelation and again that's not how you say his last name but that's how we're saying it now um is with revelation is we were seeing things that look like indicating that he was getting ready to go as well um and greg says that it seems he has an, his appointment set and that he will be going which seems like it might be ahead of schedule compared to everybody else uh that we've seen so revelation um we'll see how how quickly he comes in i wouldn't be surprised if they get sega in by you know monday tuesday of next week i refuse to believe it's going to happen this weekend uh by monday tuesday of of next week uh over the long holiday maybe and he comes into tuesday and can sort of start training with guys and and do that stuff and there's there's a quarantine process that probably is being adhered to i'll just pretend it is um <laughs> but as they get everybody sort of uh ready and and, and going for this um i wouldn't be surprised if you get Rebel Son in as well uh, before the you know the next game the the June nineteenth. I'm not saying you know he may be coming in June eighteenth. All right, but I, I feel like we're going to sort of uh, put that in uh, different things. By the way, uh, we have to stop and pause because we had like a bunch of super chats that we were sort of hot and heavy, and I didn't want to. I wanted to was, get to them. Yeah, yeah. It was during the D DTK time. Yeah, so go ahead. Run okay. It back. So, yeah, uh, Herb continues to build his memorial uh, <laughs> here at the at the studio. Uh, another twenty five dollars super chat from Herb. Um, I, if I find out this is your kid's college fund, I'm going to be very well. I, I won't be that disappointed. It's whatever you want to do with your money. Uh, but uh, he says, uh, D, uh, "DTK can't say enough praises for your quality work. No other Galaxy podcast has such guests, such insight. Enjoy your uh, vacation, Josh. Darn you for wanting to spend time with your family. It's there's no games going on. You guys aren't going to miss me that much. So thank you, Herb. We appreciate it. Uh, John was in the chat room and john was struggling with his paypal account while he was trying to do this he was <laughs> basically that. yeah he was he was threatening to buy everything in the store if he could just <laughs> do it uh but he had a super sticker which is even fun too because i don't even awesome. know if we had any super stickers before but twenty dollars uh from john there as well and then uh to catch all the stuff up uh humble uh humble beast says uh five dollars uh, i always catch you guys late on the live shows but just wanted to send this to support the great show and vamos galaxy this weekend so there you go um that's that's where we're going that's exciting great. times. Yeah. yeah. And, and just to go back to, uh, you know, the players coming in, uh, Sega and, and Ryan, <laughs> we're going to figure this out. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, when you look at Cabral, when Cabral was able to finally come in, he was at a game watching it in the stands and then kind of picked up. I think what you may see, best case scenario, probably, uh, you know, if this could happen, maybe, you know, you see Sega and and, and Revolution at the game Saturday. Maybe, uh, probably not, but, you know, <laughs> definitely Se not. Sega, maybe. Uh, okay. Revelation the seems like a, yeah a little bit longer. Yeah, but but the good news is the next game not being until you know June nineteenth. I think that that gives them a little more time. So you'll definitely see them if not on the field at least at the game in those boxes. Uh, if, you know protocols and negative tests all come back, uh, which it looks like that you know there hasn't been any issues in MLS that I've heard, which is nice. Uh, you know you know now with the rosters that not being a major issue. So we're we're getting closer. It's starting to very close. Yeah. Um, uh, by the way, I had been talking to the galaxy, uh, you know, sort of, uh, off the record on some stuff. Um, and yes, they're still hunting. I know Dennis was like, you know, probably this is going to be Dennis's answer. If you ever ask him, he's like, probably not. We're probably not done. We probably have more. We probably need to, you know, but like, there's nothing that's like stoking the fires. We know that he's having conversations when those conversations come to fruition and how they move around pieces in order to solve those problems. That's a, that's a different, yeah. different conversation altogether. So keep that in um, mind. I was going to um, say, whenever you, whenever you listen to Dennis, the, the word ongoing conversation 
When you hear that, that's when you drink. That's, that's when you drink. Okay, that's good. one of the one of his buzzwords. I'm almost out of Dr. Pepper, so we're gonna have to speed this up <laughs> a little bit. Unless Dr. Pepper wants to wants to sponsor us, and then I could just have a little mini fridge right here and just pop a new one out anytime, and then we can say, have like a little thing. We we would do that, right? We would sell ourselves say, for Dr. Pepper. Ab- absolutely, just hook up the little IV, or you get the straw with the you know yeah the, 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 the glasses, glasses the glasses yeah. straw. Yeah, that's yeah, good. I'm in. Yeah, I'm. You know me. Yeah. I'll sell myself out real quick. Yeah, I know it's not even hard. I don't. You, you don't have to produce <laughs> money. It just just. Yeah, so. uh, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I'll make a video because I want to. Yeah, this is the guy who does TikTok dances that you know just just because no one's even paying me for those. <laughs> what was our we were in a group chat and you said something is like oh like you, you were starting to get all serious on something says the guy who makes TikTok videos right it was like yeah, yeah okay well it yeah. was it was the power rankings so it was like yes. these guys don't take themselves seriously you know they're they're treating this like a joke uh, and then <laughs> sincerely the guy who does you know dancing videos on game day so oh. take that for what it's worth. Oh, MLS so- power so much fun so much fun let's get a little bit to um this san jose game um because i you know it's an interesting one um i I wanted to say that unfortunately and i i'm not a fan you can be a fan all you want if you like these parley kits i i do i cannot get behind them because they're all the same i will watch highlights because i'm not going to get to watch this game live and then i will watch highlights around the league and i will constantly be looking at wait who has the which team is this i don't know like get me you know give me 27 different variations or play these games one at a time so that way i can keep track of everything but all this weekend it's going to be like wait who's the home team who's the away team and you know what makes this one even more frustrating is traditionally the Galaxy are in white yes. and San Jose is in blue. Mm-hmm. So this is even that much more of a twist. I like the jerseys. I, I you know, um, to, uh, to me, the contrast is better than it's been in years past. So I, I don't mind the camp matchups, but you're right. When As someone who follows the league and looks to go look at highlights, it, it's a mess. And especially, you know, when you pull up uh, ESPN Plus that morning, you're like, okay, Chicago's playing Vancouver. Wait, who's who? Yeah. You know, I, I don't mm-hmm. know these players that well. Like, it, it makes it a little bit confusing. Uh, so I hear you, even though I like the jerseys and the colors are going to be swapped. Uh, yeah, maybe, they, maybe they'll figure something out, you know, with this to make it a little bit easier. But at the same time, that's how you roll it out. So probably not. Did you just flip me off or was that a fingers no, crossed? No, that was, that was, I was, I was, I was fingers, fingers crossed. Family. Fingers crossed. Like, yeah, hey. Get your angles right. I'm oh, sorry. I'll, I'll work on my blocking. <laughs> This is why I need to go on vacation, all right? I need to practice my blocking. Um, yeah, no, so uh, that's where we sit. Uh, the game is coming up Saturday, May 29th. It's a 4 p.m. Uh, I was going to say it's a 4 p.m. kickoff. It's a 4 p.m. TV start time. It is a 4.03 p.m. kickoff. All you people... Yeah, I was going to say, all you people who like to show up whenever the kickoff is better be in your seats at 4 p.m. because they're kicking, dropping that ball at 4.03 p.m. So again, just be ready for that. That's coming up this Saturday. Uh, the, t- the TV uh, is on Unamas. Uh, usually, I think they broadcast those games on Twitter as well. So yep. you should be able to find it on Twitter. But again, a 4.03 p.m. kickoff time. LA Galaxy are 4-2-0 and th- against the 3-4-0 and Quakes. Um, if you look at the uh, the home games for the Galaxy we've talked about, they're undefeated so far. They have nine points out of three games at home. Uh, that is a great start. That needs to continue against San Jose. This is that yeah. riding the ship after a, just a weird, weird game against Portland. You need to sort of like rinse that out of your mouth with this yeah. um, and, and that, have a good response. That, that was one of the most frustrating things is the Galaxy looked like they were in that game for, for the 44 minutes, you know. Portland had their chances, and and their their XG was there, and maybe Portland could have nabbed the goal if we didn't have Jonathan Bond back there. But the Galaxy didn't look awful, and they had their chances on offense as well. It just didn't; they weren't as clean. So I would have loved to have seen that game, uh, you know, you know, full strength for a full ninety. Right. So you think, like, you know, away to Seattle, that's a loss. You know, what are you going to do there? Uh, away to Portland, that's a loss. That's a tough one. But San Jose coming into your house. Uh, these are the games you have to take care of business. So again, you know, maybe you can steal a point or, or on, on the road, but at home against a rival, against a team that's not, you know, San Jose, they had a hot start as well, but this is not a team that's, uh, you know, top, you know, top echelon MLS. So this is a team that, you know, is at your level or lower. You need to take care of business against these teams. This is a quirky team. Right. This yeah. is a quirky team. They have this this man to man defense that they play. And Dan Saris was talking about it a little bit today. And he's like, you know, that's stuff they just try to do to confuse you. He goes, We just need to play our game. Like we yeah. should have the ball. Really what Saris was saying is we should have the ball. We shouldn't need to be worrying about this man to man defense thing that is going Which, out there. Not saying they're not not preparing for it, just saying that if they play their game, they shouldn't have to worry about um all of this. 
Uh, and you did, you saw yeah. that in Portland, you saw a galaxy maintain possession and knock it around and pick their moments where, where Portland had their chances was again on the counter. And so San Jose plays that way as well. So, uh, it could get ugly if, if the galaxy don't, don't play their game where they get rattled. Uh, but I think, uh, I think with the roster that, that San Jose is bringing, obviously Cade Cowell, someone who's kind of had a little bit of a breakout a uh, year for them. So he, he's been playing really well. The youngster, he embarrassed the galaxy a little bit last season, uh, when San Jose came into town. So he's a player you'll want to watch. And, and I'm probably sure Dan stairs will have his eyes on him. Right. Uh, then the good news is Jackson Yule, who's another, you know, strong member of that team. He's actually with Sebastian in Switzerland right now. He's part of that roster. So him not being there, I think is a good thing, not having that heart at the center of their midfield. So the galaxy really have a lot of opportunities to take care of business against San Jose. Yeah, if you look at their passing charts and just, you know, some of the guys who are sort of in there, Jackson Ewell is one of those key sort of uh, areas sitting in the center of the field and has a lot of strong connections there. Um, I think the really interesting thing, if you look at the passing chart, is that um, Tommy Thompson, defender on the right-hand side, gets way up that right-hand side. His average position is way up the field. Um, a lot like the LA Galaxy, whenever they're in a very attacking um, sort of mindset where you see Julian Araujo really attack up that side. So look for that. That's going to be on Jorge Villafania's side. Um, of things and and, and also Kevin and, Cabral's side. So this yeah. could be this could be the Kevin Cabral show. He could he could announce himself to yeah. Los Angeles. That would be nice. There this should be a nice be, game to do it. There there should be some space behind Thompson um on this. And and granted, you know, San Jose was playing at home in the game that we're looking at the passing network, and so they should be more adventurous, but they got their butts kicked by by uh, sporting Kansas City three to one. So um this is not a a great San Jose team, but because it's a rivalry, because they certainly get up for it, it's a difficult game for the Galaxy to play. Yeah. Um, and it's a difficult game for the Galaxy to win. Um, they should win. They're at home. They should. I thought it was really interesting. In the Western Conference, two teams have given up 11 goals. Uh, the LA Galaxy and the San Jose Earthquakes. So you have the two yeah. goalkeepers, Jonathan Bond and JT Marcinkowski, um, who are these guys who who have given up a whole bunch of goals. If you look at the save percentage, however, 76.3% uh, on the save percentage for Jonathan Bond, 66.7% save percentage on uh, Marcinkowski. And um, uh, that considering, put, yeah. considering the amount of shots faced, that's... A, so, a good sign, a good so, sign for Bond. So Jonathan Bond is number one in shots faced in Major League Soccer, right? Um, tied for second in goals allowed behind Cincinnati has given up 14. LA, San Jose, DC all given up 11. Uh, Galaxy are second um, worst in shots on target against, which I thought was an interesting uh, one. So 38, Cincinnati has 39. Um, when you look at that one, by the way, I would just like to point out, if you want to know what a defense, a really good defense does, Nashville has allowed only 10 shots on target so far this year. Um, so that's 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 the, there's the growth, right? The next thing is to not just have a back line, but to have a midfield that is solid enough that's, to be able to stop those shots too. I think that's what that's what Nashville does is they don't even let it get to Dave Romney's defense back there. You have to call it Dave Romney's Dave Rom yeah, yeah, Dave Nashville Romney's. defense. Yeah, that, that's good. No, I, I like that. So yeah, look for um, San Jose. Uh, they're they're a difficult team to play against. For me, this is an LA Galaxy win. What does five thirty eight say about this game? Not, not as high as a percentage as the Galaxy have been before as favorites. The LA Galaxy are forty seven percent chance. Uh, have a 47% chance to win it. San Jose has a 31% chance to win it, and then a 22% chance for a draw. So uh, Galaxy is heavy favorites, like against Austin, they're hovering around that 56, 57% range. So this is about 10% lower. So they're not rated as highly. Um, I think, you know, as the season goes on, again, this is restating the obvious, you know, you score goals when you take more shots. Uh, we learn more about this team the more games they play. I think, you know, going away to San Jose, or going away to Seattle, um, you know, who's the top, the cream of the crop as far as MLS goes, playing a half, you know, the man down in Portland, that's hard to tell you something here. But here, a San Jose team about at the Galaxy's level or the Galaxy should be a little bit better than, this is going to tell you where this Galaxy team is. I think this this is a game that will tell you a lot. Are, can they take care of business when they're supposed to? Or, you know, are they going to struggle or San Jose going to be that that bugaboo team that they've been uh, in recent years? But I, I think the Galaxy should put it out. I would say like a 3-2 win. They'll give up some goals, but they should they should put some goals in as well. These games are always wild. That was I was gonna say three two and now I'm See, now we did it last I, didn't, week too. I, I know <laughs> and Derek Williams screwed that up right yeah. I mean that was that was really I had my I think we were, I said two one or three or three two I don't remember what we said but oh we said draws we thought there was we said a draw one coming. one draws yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so oh, we thought there was draw I think the Galaxy win this uh, I'm gonna say three one I'm gonna say okay. that the Galaxy uh, I think it's gonna be a close game um, but you know you're gonna get somebody who scores in the second half when it's two one to sort of make it a three one game and put the put the game to bed and that's gonna be it. 
a squeaky bum game there. Make, yeah. make him make make you earn it. It doesn't matter. I don't have to watch it. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be watching. I'm gonna be gone. So, um, Larry Morgan is doing our coverage again. If you're looking for us on Twitter um, for this game, there won't be any, and unless somehow I arrive where I'm supposed to be and I have the time, and you know there aren't screaming kids and angry wife who's like, no, you can't. You know, what are you? Are you crazy trying to watch this game? If that happens, then you might see me pop up on Twitter. That's unlikely to happen in this particular scenario. And then the LA Galaxy are off until um, you know June 19th. So uh, that's where we go full attendance. That's where we we get everybody back and so that's sort of um you know what we're looking at now uh for this la galaxy team and and sort of prepping so i think this will be a, a really good test for the la galaxy in terms of you know where they're going to be and 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 how good this team is still we're still in this test mode and yeah. this is going to be one of those uh that sort of tells you what's going on fyi um no show on May 31st, right? That There's no show then. Uh, no show on June 3rd. No show on June 7th. However, right now on June 10th, I am scheduled to be back um, for a live show on, uh, my on birthday. June 10th. Is it? Yeah, June so you won't be on. Birthday, I'm so definitely not be here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I'd like to, uh, boss, I'd like to put in my, my request for time off. Yeah, granted. <laughs> granted. <laughs> there we Absolutely. Go. All right, good done deal. Any, anything else you want to talk about before we get out of here? No, I think we're good. Let's be, beat the quakes. All right, sounds good. All right, tell people where they can find you. Let's go. All right, as always, you can find me on Twitter at Hammer EV. You can also find me on Instagram at Galaxy Profile. That's Galaxy P R O F O U L. All right, if you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at Jay Guessman or at Galaxy Podcast. Head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com. Written articles, videos, podcasts, all that stuff is right there for you. Big game coming up on Saturday LA Galaxy, San Jose Earthquakes, Cali Classico coming up at 4 p.m. on Saturday, May 29th on Unamas. All right, for. Eric, the Portuguese Hammer Vieira. I'm Josh Pato Guessman. You've been listening. You've been watching to Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Everyone have a safe long weekend. I will catch you when I'm back from vacation. Have a great one, everybody. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening, and we ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody. <laughs>